Okay. Um, I'm assuming that that's cool. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've just closed it again. <laughs> Hit it full screen. Right. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'll carry on. If anyone has any problems or can't hear me or whatever, please jump in and let me know. Um, thanks for the introduction, Anton. Uh, my name is Chris Green. I uh, work at Strategic Marketing based uh, in Ipswich, Suffolk in the UK. Um, for those who aren't familiar, you know, uh, about an hour or so out of London, um, lovely part of the world, come visit. Um, and today I'm going to run through um, something I call metric misuse. Um, just sort of fundamentally looking at data and the way you know not to use it or how it easily it can be misused. So um, I hope from this you know gain a bit of an understanding around um, some data, uh, particularly for those who are only just kind of getting to grips with it. Um, and hopefully it'll be a reminder to some as well that you know I mean we all get a little bit carried away with numbers sometimes, uh, myself included. So this is this is kind of around that. Um, so I've touched upon it already, but you know, what is metric misuse? I think, for me, fundamentally, it's uh, an over-reliance of what I call the wrong numbers. Um, you know, there there aren't no numbers are inherently useless, but it's the the kind of the application of them. So when I talk about the wrong numbers in this case, it is it is of course you know, picking the right stats for the right occasion and using them appropriately. Um, but why does this kind of thing happen? I mean, there, there are <coughs> lots of different reasons. Um, some, I would argue, are kind of unintentional. Some, possibly, you know, are more wanted and willing. Um, but I think one of the key ones is this kind of misunderstanding. Um, ultimately, a misunderstanding around um, what the data is showing you um, and what that kind of gives you. Um, so that's the kind of key one. And the, this kind of misunderstanding and this um, maybe an overinflated self confidence is just because something you've got a number there doesn't necessarily mean it's true or it's any more accurate. And we'll get into sort of a bit more of why that's the case. Um, and I think fundamentally, you know, arguments should be supported by data. Um, you know, not moulded to fit it. So, you know, you the idea that kind of the process and how you use marketing data is you look at it and then you use the data to tell your story um, rather than necessarily get the story in your head and try and look for the data to back that, that up necessarily. Um, so in this webinar so we'll look to cover 10 frequently misused metrics in digital marketing. Um, I'm not saying it's the 10 uh, or there only is 10. Uh, or necessarily, you know, there are lots of others that do, you know, go a bit wayward. But <clears throat> I picked ten of what I consider the most frequently misused ones, and uh, ultimately give some advice on how to avoid that. So the first one I'm actually going to start off with. Uh, I don't know if some are going to find this a sort of a bit contentious or what, but uh, the idea of rankings, uh, and by rankings we mean sort of tracking data from keywords in organic positions, uh, particularly in Google, but it could be other search engines. Um, and I wanted to start off with this because primarily I'm an SEO. Um, I know you know how quickly you know, Google is changing and what that change brings. Um, but I think you know ranking data is something. It's, it's kind of a legacy or a, a crutch that SEOs have stood on for a long time. Um, and rankings have chiefly been the key of what we've worked to. But I think for various reasons that I'll come to. <clears throat> it's, it's something that we need to sort of move away from, or at least change how we use this data. Okay, as we said, it's one of the most misused. Um, and that's mainly because what we're actually measuring when we talk about rankings here isn't that easy to measure, fundamentally. Um, and I'm not going to kind of get into the ins and outs of it now, but to put really simply, you know, what is the weather outside at the moment? Um, you know, out here it's sunny but quite cold uh, relative to where we are. But you know, now, if I were to phone someone in a different time zone, uh, any of you guys on the panel, for example, it won't, that weather that I get now, it won't be the same necessarily as what we're experiencing now. Now, I know, you know, likening rankings to the weather and, you know, just because it's hot here doesn't mean it'll be hot somewhere else. Um, you know, it doesn't mean it's analogous to that degree. So just because something's ranking position four, where I'm based now, doesn't mean it won't be position 10, 20, or what's happening um, in other positions on the planet. But 
I guess the, the whole Weber and the Google algorithm analogy can be useful to a degree because it is different. It's based on lots of factors. Rankings aren't universal in the same way that weather is. It's based on personalization, search location, and so many other factors. So when we, we, we kind of create this number for rankings and present it as a stat, um, it only really means that it's a snapshot of one keyword's position in one place measured on one device at a given time, um, which is a big limitation. It's not to say that rankings aren't useful. You know, rankings can provide a very good benchmark if you're always checking from that same point of reference. Um, and they can really be used to monitor your progress and troubleshoot any issues. And that's what they're really good at. If, if you know, things uh, start to drop, you know, particular keywords or groups of keywords or pages have issues, that will show you something is changing. You know, Google is <clears throat> regarding your results differently. Um, but the fundamental kind of factor, and this, and this, this kind of thought will underpin kind of all the metrics in here is, you know, why are you tracking rankings? Um, is it because rankings equals traffic? And is traffic your goal? Um, now, for most people, they will be to some degree, and it will always factor in your campaign, which is why uh, rankings is, is, is still useful. Um, but you have to use this data wisely. <coughs> That's the key. So as I said, know where the limitation is and know what you're showing. Um, and more importantly, don't get an, uh, an over sense of confidence of it. Okay, so next one, I want to go on to another kind of SEO metric, inverted commas, and that's that. It's a little bit more complex. It's uh, new and lost links, um, by which, for, I mean, backlinks, um, as measured uh, by sort of other backlink tools. Um, this graph, actually, incidentally, is, is Google's new and lost links. Um, you know, when you consider that on a, on a daily basis, um, you know, they, well, there's millions of links there. I just put that on the example, it was quite cool. So an example of why new and lost links can be misleading, um, and I think the more the kind of the misuse here is how, again, it's how the stat's used. It's not that the stat itself is fundamentally bad. Um, but by way of an example, so my rankings on a particular keyword you know, dropped on the second of this month. So something happened on that day that caused a problem. And I've seen it happen before where the first reaction is to go to a new and lost links report. We say, actually, well, I've checked. I've seen that we've lost some links on that day. Oh, okay, so, you know, that's why there's a problem. So, you know, I've lost some links. You know, what can I do to bring them back? Now, that's, that's problematic. Um, the first thing to consider is, you know, which tool did you use? I've posted um, sort of free tools here. Personally, I use Majestic, but I've also used Ahrefs. You know, all of these free tools, even um, Google Search Console, can all provide uh, link data and help you work out what links you're gaining and losing. Um, but especially with these three I've mentioned, you know, how do these tools discover backlinks? Um, I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I mean, they, they crawl the web in the same way that Google, or in a similar fashion to the way that Google does, prioritizes which links to look at and when to look at them and process them. But the key fact here, or the key point to consider, is will it crawl the same links as Google? At the same time, um, you know, I think probably not, and I think this is the problem. So, you know, going back to that graph on the second of the month when we saw a large loss in links, the chances of you know Majestic or Ahrefs seeing that loss of links at the same time as Google is very slim, um, and that's why using this data to pinpoint specific drops in performance against drops in, in link data, it, it's 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 very unlikely that that will tally up in any kind of useful fashion. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, new and lost links is a goodish benchmark if you check the same source. Um, so if you're checking something over a greater period of time, you notice that predominantly the trends is, that, you know, for example, a trend is you're getting lots of new links, or a trend is that you're actually losing a lot of links, or maybe the type of links that you're gaining and losing are, are good or bad. Um, and that's actually a good way of measuring the performance of a campaign. But, you know, <clears throat> it's not a good way <clears throat> at diagnosing ranking changes over short periods of time. Um, and that's really where the main cautionary point on this is. Avoid doing this if you can, um, because it's going to lead you ultimately in the wrong direction. Look for trends over longer periods. 
and sort of factor that in the rest of your data. That's the way of making this really useful. Um, and actually, if you can, I know I said use one traffic source, but it can be useful, uh, one data source, sorry, it can be useful to look at multiples side by side. So not necessarily the same mix linking data, but don't just rely on one tool all the time. <clears throat> right, so they're the kind of, the, the core SEO metrics out of the way. So what we want to do now is just move on to some others, and I'll take this in fortune. Right, so this one, um, again, quite a, a misused sort of uh, key stats, and that's actually average monthly traffic um, that keywords generate. Um, now, I, in this instance, I'm predominantly going to refer to Google AdWords, but it also could be uh, Bing Ads. Um, this data is uh, attributed from their search data, so you know, they're obviously recording who searches for what and when, and will provide the averages. Um, and this data is really useful, uh, not just to SEOs, paid search marketers, but also just in getting an idea of, of what is in trend and what is out of. Um, so, you know, a very valid thing in its own right. Um, you know, these are approximate search volumes as they're reported. Um, but we really have to present these with some quite strong caveats because this, again, this is where we go down the, the route of potential misuse. The first thing to bear in mind, and this is something that they, Google, even says within its own documentation quite clearly, is you know, it is based on the past and it is an average. Um, I'm not sure that anyone really assumes that these numbers will be indicative of what happens in the future. But you know, really remember that, that they account for what has happened. Now, if you're looking at very seasonal keywords or industries that have very much the similar trends happening year on year, can be quite helpful, um, but ultimately they don't predict the future. Um, you don't know what keywords are going to get better or what are going to get worse. Um, and the other thing to really consider is these are very, very rough numbers, and there's quite a lot of judicious rounding, um, particularly if you're looking, uh, you know, looking at the numbers and thinking that all of these numbers seem kind of very perfect, and how, you know, especially when you get into low search volumes, it seems to lose all granularity. You know, if you're operating like really tight niches or very long tail searches or even local, it's not uncommon to see that a lot of searches are based at zero um, or ten. Now, it could be quite simple that, you know, I know myself on a lot of keywords that I've tracked, I've searched for a particular keyword more than ten times, and the chance of those ten searches appearing in the keyword data is probably quite slim. Um, so it's just very key to sort of remember that you know, the I wouldn't ever treat these as kind of facts. You know, they're they're, they're guidelines. Um, and as we mentioned, these can be particularly hard to judge on lower search weight terms. Now, what these do do is they operate next to each other quite well. So, uh, you know, a, a keyword that's tracked as uh, 300 searches a month versus one that's tracked against a thousand. Obviously, the latter, the thousand searches will be having higher traffic, um, whether or not it necessarily means that there are 300 searching for one and 1,000 searching for another at any given time. I debate that that's, that's probably not the most accurate way of looking at that. <clears throat> but the key thing to, to kind of mention here, and it's, it's making me sound a little bit paranoid, really, is that these figures are from tools which ultimately are helping you spend money. Um, and that's that's not really necessarily a dig at, at Google or Bing. Um, but, you know, AdWords makes its money because advertisers pay it. And that's just something to bear in mind. That's not me necessarily saying that they're going to try and get you to spend excess amounts of money or more than you should. But, you know, <clears throat> take it with um, a pinch of salt, you know, with the spirit that it's intended. Um, and we've probably all heard this, or if we haven't, we will do if we work in marketing for long enough. It's, if I get into X position, I'll get X traffic from that key term. Yeah, and it, my answer to that is always sometimes. I don't fundamentally think that that's, that's wrong. Um, depends how you use it. I mean, there's a couple of really key things to remember. Search results for different keywords are all different. Um, the makeup of these pages, the number of paid ads, uh, whether it's got a map or a knowledge um, graph or an answer box, whether there are 10 organic results or seven, <coughs> are all going to influence, you know, what this data translate to in fact. Um, and another sort of key to consider is that click-through rates, because of what I mentioned, will ultimately be very different. Um, and these search volumes show that all of the traffic that's sort of being searched for, not just those who click on ads or organic listings or any particular part, 
Um, and this is where this data becomes probably less useful and, and easier to be misused. Uh, again, just because something searched for 300 times, it's hard to know how much of that those 300 people are going to make it through to organic. So if that's what why you're using this data, um, you, you're ultimately better in testing and seeing what comes through um, on paid or even organic after a long period for you to really get an idea of what that actual search weight is rather than the sort of average as predicted. Uh, okay, so the next step um, is, I'm, I'm calling this my favourite, uh, in a very kind of a loose sense of the word, just because I think it's it's one that anyone that's gone to grips with digital marketing um, or even analytics will know uh, is, is quite well commonly cited, and that's bounce rate. Um, and I, in this I mean bounce rate is tracked by Google Analytics. Um, and as I mentioned, it is a very commonly misused step, and it could I would argue almost have gone um, unsaid, you know, did I really need to bring this up? Uh, and I would say, you know, almost gone. It, it's, it's, you know, it's almost so misused, I need to kind of raise it again. Um, because I think it's important to understand why, you know, bounce rate is misunderstood, and why that makes it um, a kind of a misused stat. Um, and it's not always because, it, you know, the fact that a bounce rate isn't always bad. So, you know, someone will look at a website and see that a page has a 60% bounce rate or an 80% bounce rate, and then automatically assume that that page is failing. Um, you know, and that's not necessarily the, where I'm going with this, and I'm not going to get too caught up there. Um, you know, I think if we assume that a bounce isn't always bad, we can kind of move on. But the, the, the real kind of method of my madness here is because how you measure bounce isn't foolproof, and that's largely based on how Google Analytics work. Um, and I think it's really important for us to understand how that bounce rate is calculated, um, and you know, who better to explain than Google. So, is the percentage of visitors to a particular website who navigate away from the site after viewing only one page? So it's quite simple. Um, you type something into Google, click on the result, you land on the page, page loads, and then you you bounce off again, or you leave, and that counts as a bounce. Now. <clears throat> the kind of the key the key point here is Google Analytics tracking loads when a page loads, um, roughly speaking, and that's that's how if it's implemented correctly. Um, and a bounce is measured when the code is only loaded once per session. Um, and there are ultimately going to be some factors in there that cause problems. Uh, one of which being, you know, if you leave before a page is fully loaded, before Google has had a chance. Um, to track your visit, that would be a bounce. It hasn't been recorded as a bounce. Um, you know, the particularly slow internet connections are often a, a big cause of problem for this. Um, but you know, there are kind of further reasons. You know, Google Analytics doesn't register multiple page views unless a user reloads that page on one page websites, um, which again, some Google brought up, which is bad news because if you have a one page website and people spend all of their time on that page, they don't reload the Google Analytics, you know, that's a bounce, um, which isn't necessarily that accurate or indicative of the usage of that page. So that stat within your Google, Google Analytics is going to be um, highly problematic. <clears throat> and this second page view needs to be made within the same sort of session. Now, I'm not going to get too into how the, the Google defines the session. Um, but sessions, as tracked by Google Analytics, can expire. Um, so, by which we mean you know, after 30 minutes in activity or at midnight, for example. So, what that means is you spend too long inactive on a page, that can count as a bounce. Um, I mean, it is conceivable that you might spend more than 30 minutes on a given page because of the content. Um, but if you become active again after that 30 minutes, that's still going to classify as a bounce. Um, now, we can make bounce rate, bounce rate more meaningful, and um, it is still a very important metric. Um, and how you do this, again, without going into too much depth, but you know, make sure that you are tracking interactions with a pay in a, uh, on a page, um, even if you're not traveling to separate pages. So if you've got buttons or links within a page, um, or even setting up event tracking on scroll depth, or the length of time that you're on there, can help give you greater insights, and you'll actually see that if you start employing some of these methods, your actual bounce rate, as measured by Google Analytics, will drop, and it will hopefully give you a better indication as to what the actual engagement with that page is like. Um, 
And the kind of the key thing to take away, especially if you've not, you know, not had a chance to make balance rate that meaningful, is that it's a useful metric. But for me, it always operates as the start of a question or a line of investigation. It shouldn't be used as an answer. So, you know, look at a page. I think it's got a high bounce rate. That's the problem. Um, the high bounce rate will be a symptom of something. Um, whether the symptom is that the page isn't very good or that you're not tracking it very well, you need to get to the bottom of that before you can kind of really make the most of it. Um, and talking about bounce rate, it moves me on quite nicely to average time on site, which as a metric is quite closely related um, in terms of my problem with it and how it's used. Um, and it's slightly less well known as a misused metric, but I think actually that makes it slightly more kind of dangerous necessarily. Um, and what <clears throat> and what we mean just like, just for reference by average time on site is you know, how long people will spend on there. Um, but again the key to understanding that is how it's calculated. Um, and the problem is not because of what it is measuring, but mostly what it isn't measuring, and what it, what it kind of misses. Um, so if a balance is when you only hit one page and then leave, um, time on site can only be measured in Google Analytics when you view more than one page. Um, so hopefully you can kind of see where the problem is here. So if we look at an 80% bounce rate on the site, but your average time on site is five minutes, you've got to think, well, that's five minutes for the average time on site for the 20% of people who didn't bounce. So you've got to be very careful when you're using this stat because it's actually, I would argue, not very representative of your actual use case, your, your, your user base on the site. Now, if we look at a slightly more complex example of where it could be a problem, if someone spends four minutes on page one, then three minutes on page two and exits, how long is that recorded? Um, hopefully some of you already can guess, but four minutes, because the second page view is effectively lost when you leave. You know, if you're not triggering that second um, analytics tracking instance, or third, should I say, when you're leaving the site, um, Google doesn't know when that search, when that page view ends. <coughs> so it is an issue, um, and this can be solved in the same way as bounce rate. You just find ways of tracking engagement better. So as I said, you know, tracking buttons, links, uh, scroll depth if you have a deep site, um, or even just time on site. Or at minimum, at least be aware of how limiting uh, or limited this data is or can be. Um, you know, basing a crucial business decision on what is effectively 20% of your website data uh, can be very risky because there's a lot you're not seeing. Okay, next one, page views. Now, Staying in the theme of analytics, I wouldn't. I would argue this probably isn't a massive misuse case, <clears throat> but I'm, the reason why I'm mentioning it here is because it's worth noting when ultimately it can go wrong. So, when do page views not measure a page view specifically? Um, most of the time, when you have tracking setup problems. So, you know, you could say that this isn't really a misuse of the metric. This is just you tracking something wrong. That is quite fair, um, but this is a common scenario I've seen nonetheless. Uh, adding Google Tag Manager without removing Universal Analytics code. So inadvertently, you have two tracking codes on the page at once. Uh, and what this basically causes is double page views. Uh, and the way you can spot this is looking at your bounce rate. So as indicated there, that bounce rate of 0.77%, no matter how good your website is, I doubt it's that good. Um, and <clears throat> This is telling that actually my session um, or page view data there is wrong um, because there's a tracking problem. But also, if um, we stray away from the kind of the incorrect code setup problems, page view can be misleading um, depending on how you track goals. Now, if you if you use virtual page views quite heavily, um, which is something I always try and stray away from, uh, it can actually, well, unsurprisingly inflate your page view count on the website because a virtual page view will register in the same way. Not a big problem, but as we're on it, you know, just be aware. <clears throat> now, moving into uh, more kind of paid, um, social kind of sphere of things, really, we talk about impressions um, or even kind of video plays, that kind of engagement data. And it's a stat that really leaves me quite conflicted. And again, by way of an example, here's why. The fact that you know reporting to a client, 12, uh, 120,000 people saw your ads. Sounds like an impressive number. 
But the questions that, that then raises they're great. It's like, well, but did they? Um, and what does this mean? So they start with when social networks measure impressions, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you had that many eyes on your, your advert or your piece of content. Um, much less say that it doesn't even mean that they're even conscious that they saw it. Um, and what does it mean? Now, <clears throat> to say it wasn't conscious doesn't mean it's a bad thing because subconscious um, kind of uh, consumption of, of your content can be a good thing. It's a good brand building metric. Um, but it's, it's good to put that figure in context. Um, and it's not to say that the number of impressions is bad, as I said. Um, but I have seen it misused because it is can be quite a cheap an easy metric to influence and therefore it can become pointless um, if it's just done for the sake of it. Now, I have worked on brand campaigns where impressions is the goal um, and sometimes you know, it is just a blanket, let's get an ad or a piece of content out as far and wide as we can go. Um, and if that is your goal and that's what you're working to, then fine. It's a very valid and accurate use uh, in the same way that it can be valid and accurate when used with other more meaningful engagement and click stats. Um, but I would caution um, that it's not standalone. And really, you need to think about what an impression means against your campaign goal and use and report upon it accordingly. Okay. <clears throat> now, we're getting sort of slightly towards sort of the, the end of this now, which is good because uh, I am losing my voice slightly. Um, but for number eight, we are going back to Google Analytics now for site conversion rate. Um, and this is more of a, a kind of a caution on how conversions are conveyed in Google Analytics, particularly, um, you know, if you are tracking quite a few sort of different types of conversions. Um, and just sort of for reference, a conversion is a goal which is triggered on your site. Uh, could be time on site, could be a contact submission or a page view. You know, these all count as a conversion and therefore add or count to your site's conversion rate as measured uh, by Google. But I'd argue there's a crucial difference between the types of conversions and the way that Google splits them up um, is in terms of macro and micro conversions. So typically a macro conversion, uh, i.e. a big one or an important conversion, is a lead or a contact form filled in, whereas a micro conversion could simply just be a page view or it could be the fact that someone has been on the website for more than three pages. Um, now, the importance of these different types of conversions can make a huge difference because when Google reports or Google Analytics reports on your overall site conversion rate, it will take these two types of conversions and bundle them together. And what it can lead you know, to see is a site conversion rate of 30%, and that's that, that's potentially great. Um, but to help give it a kind of another way of looking at this, uh, as Avanesh says, you know, a site success is much bigger than than just that one number. And if that one number of site conversion rates are 30%, 90% of those conversions are micro conversions like page views. You know, is your site really converting at 30%? Well, not in a way that I think is overly valuable to your campaign goal. If actually what is more important to your campaign is uh, interactions, is contacts, or more probably leads. Um, so site level conversion rate can really be woefully inaccurate at telling you know, your, your story, your campaign success. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, just word of caution there is when you are reporting on that metric, be, be aware of what it actually is telling you. Um, and if you need to, isolate your core conversions, your, your macro conversions, to report on your actual success. Um, right, number nine, uh, I want to look at referrals um, and protect you know, the uh, influence of referral spam. Um, referral spam, you know, hopefully most of you know, is kind of becoming the scourge of the industry uh, in that um, it's ways of other websites or bots or web crawlers to actually um, influence your Google Analytics data by basically saying that they've hit your website when they have it. Um, and this is something that can really catch out a casual analytics user because all of these referrals that are hitting your site are triggering further traffic. So if you look at traffic from just a top level uh, without paying heed to referrals and where these referrals are coming from, it can actually make your website look like it's, it's drawing a lot more people to your site than it really does, which you know, is a problem. 
And ultimately, referral spam ruins data. It makes page views and users as stats um, more than they really are, or essentially more useless than they really are. Um, and it also pollutes your kind of user engagement data as well. Um, <clears throat> and it is, it's kind of uh, worthwhile adding in here that it's not a significant problem for your website as a whole. You know, there's no reason to become overly worried about referral spam and it might be affecting your site or whether Google is actually judging your site's performance um, because this you know, engagement from referral spam is bad. It's not going to make your website look bad. But for the purpose of reporting and this data usage, best thing you can do is filter it out. Now, there are many different methods of doing this, um, <clears throat> but for me, the one I use um, is just filtering out using advanced segments. Um, and it's just basically filtering out traffic sources that you don't want. And there are lots of uh, crowdsourcing methods out there, but the key thing is for your Google Analytics report, look, in it, look at the referrers. If you're seeing the same referral spam coming through or sites that just you just genuinely don't think are sending you traffic, use the advanced segment to block that out. And there are, there are a ton of really awesome tutorials on this out there. But really, what we're going to do with referral spam is actually hope Google finds a better option soon. Um, it's, it's not been able to block it. Um, and every time the, the, the digital marketing community finds a workaround, so do the referrers uh, or the spammers. So all I can say on this one is, is keep on your toes and, and just be looking at that referral report and don't take it as read um, that it is all good. Right. Um, and the last one, um, which is <clears throat> probably more of a, for me, more of a curiously misused metric, and that's cost per click, um, cost per click from really from any kind of medium. And actually, I think I'd argue how cost per click is sort of measured, sort of between or compared, sorry, between different data sources. Um, and it is a very easy measurement to misuse because ultimately the wallet is doing most of the talking here. You know, when a click is a very quick and easy thing to do, when you, you kind of put it in terms of how much that's costing someone, um, they can get very sort of jittery quite quickly. Um, and to kind of put this into terms, you know, have you ever compared the cost per click of an AdWords and one keyword, uh, or on a Facebook ad, or a LinkedIn ad, or even a YouTube play? Um, I'm sure you have, because what it, effectively that metric sounds the same, even though it's measuring a, a completely different thing fundamentally, um, because it is apples and oranges. It really comes down to what is an expensive click for you. Um, but not for any given platform. <clears throat> but to answer that, you first need to know what a click is worth. Um, so you know, when we're saying that um, this phrase, or this example, sorry, I'm not going to do LinkedIn ads because it will cost me 10 times more per click than it will do for Facebook. Um, well, to a, to a point that is true, you know, the clicks on LinkedIn ads are generally more expensive, um, but that's not really telling you anything um, because presumably, the way you, or, or the way you would target the audience for a LinkedIn ad is going to be completely different than a Facebook one, or certainly the context of which would be completely different. But personally, I'd rather a fraction of the clicks if it was ten times more likely. You know, if each one of these clicks were more likely to buy that product, you know, ultimately because they were better qualified. So again, bringing back the LinkedIn Facebook comparison, if your LinkedIn ads are purely targeting people with a certain job description, and your product is something that they're interested in. Um, I would argue that those are going to be vastly more qualified than, you know, a casual Facebook user or someone that you've, you know, targeted with a Facebook campaign. Um, now that's not always the case. You know, Facebook can be well targeted too, but you know, they're very different networks and people use them differently. <clears throat> Fundamentally, you know, when you're looking at cost per click, and to really give this stat any kind of accuracy, an expensive click is one that doesn't give you anything back. You know, you could be paying 20, 30, 40 pounds a click. But if you know your overall cost per acquisition on that is far lower or brings you a good return on what your eventual sale is, you're still making money. Um, so paying for that click could be well worthwhile if you know in isolation it still sounds expensive. <coughs> but you have to measure this fundamentally. You know, to understand what the value is, you need to see what the worth it brings back to you. Um, and again, coming back to tracking, you know, track your content forms your phone leads, and even your footfall. Um, and there are some challenges inherent in doing this. Um, 
But to understand how expensive any kind of paid advertising is, you need to understand how beneficial it is or can be. <clears throat> so, I mean, ultimately, you know, from metric misuse, the big kind of to round it together, one of the big ways of avoiding it is picking the right metrics. Um, and to do this, you need to understand your objective and work backwards from there. You know, if I need more traffic or more leads, um, how do I measure that I'm getting? Um, how can I report and ultimately chart the success of my actions against that? Um, so you know, if, if you want to kind of strengthen your brand position in, in a particular marketplace, well, actually, a good indicator of that strength it might be the actual engage, level of engagement you're getting with your content. So on social and on site. So it could be how many people click, share, and like your content. How many pages people are viewing per session. How many time, what's the length of time people are viewing on your website. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is to kind of build up your indicators of success using the metrics. Um, but carefully understand what it is that they're reporting. Um, and success can be success can be easy to express if you're doing this right. Um, but there's a key, you do need to spend time here. But it is incredibly easy to be overconfident using data. Um, I think I mentioned this right from the outset is partly of the part of the, the key of it, avoiding metric misuse is understanding where the flaws in the data are. And that's not to say that it makes the data any less useful. It just means that you need to be more cautious. Um, so again, coming back to the uh, average time on site stat, you know, if your average time on site is only in effect measured by 20% of your audience, um, you know, the 20% that didn't bounce, it's not giving you a very good picture of everyone as a whole and what they're doing. <coughs> you know, fundamentally though, this comes down to don't make big decisions on bad data. Um, and for that, you need to know what data is bad. Um, and be just as sure of what you don't know about what you, you do. <clears throat> right, so that comes to the end of it. Um, I'm just about hanging in there, voice-wise. Um, but I think that the a good time to call in any questions, anything that um, you don't think I covered so well, and hopefully I can pass this back to the floor. Um, and we will see how it goes. No, okay, guys, do we have any questions? Guys, uh, well, we have, we have almost 10 people here inside and they're all gone. I, I, I don't know what happened. Uh, I guess it's a connection problem. Okay. Uh, first question I always ask is it, uh, just, just a practical one. Everybody's asking about it. Anyway, uh, slides. Will the slides available? Will you send me slides? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Um, I'll uh, upload them to SlideShare and then say, uh, share them so you can. Uh, embed them. Um, what I'll also do is uh, get a few useful links in there as well, uh, referring to some of the things that I've spoken about. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, you send me uh, send me share, uh, slides, uh, I'll, I'll upload it and uh, link will be on our page. If it would be more materials, I will will be happy to, to put it on our page. Guys, um, Bogdan, Rabel, do we have any questions? And I will check audience if audience have any questions. Uh, Bogdan, do you have any questions? Rabel, you still here? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Even two questions. <laughs> can I ask? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, please, can you tell me a good CTR is above how many percent? Also, another question, same, is interesting for e-commerce. Uh, yeah. Good yeah. conversion, minimum good conversion is above how many percent? See, I'm, I'm going to give a, not a, not a really basic, but it's um, the real challenge with giving up a good click through rate. I can't really, I can't really anything. Book done. I think I the, the problem is. Uh, uh, it amplifies, amplifies and microphone talk together. So when we talk to you, to you, any chance you can do something? Because I can hear myself, and when uh, Chris talking to you, uh, I can hear him double echo. Okay. Okay. He, he uh, just switched microphone on. Yeah. Go on, Chris. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. So the with a good uh, click through rate, it, it will vary. It will depend on um, you know d uh, from search results to ads to um, depends on the product and the industry. I mean, you know, we've got um, one of our clients is is kind of 
is looking at a lot of their click through rates, um, sort of 30 to 40 percent in some areas, which is exceptional in most places you look at. Whereas when you look at uh, maybe something the Twitter ads or uh, Facebook, you know, typically anything over four, five, six percent might seem really great, but ultimately it depends on how you're targeting it and the money that you're spending behind it. <clears throat> you know, how aggressively you're bidding the ad copy that you're using. Um, I mean, what the, the best thing to do is kind of benchmark it against your industry if you have that kind of data, um, which can be easier said than done. Um, so again, it sounds a little bit evasive, and you know, I I know I get asked this quite a lot by clients, especially when they're about to set in in, in motion some kind of paid campaign. But uh, really, the the trouble is that there is no real answer. I mean, especially the the wider the services go, or the more Google and other, other services mix up the, the general results and how they share click-through rate changes all the time. Um, and the second one was uh, e-commerce conversion rate, was that? Yeah, so from from that, guy, again, it's um, it really depends on what kind of product you're looking at, what the actual uh, cost value is. Um, but, you know, Good e-commerce conversion rates. Um, I like to see them sort of three and a half, four, five to six percent, depending on the product. Um, you know, if your product is is <coughs> typically a very high tip, uh, ticket value, or the overall sort of purchase cycle is long. Um, so, again, another client that I work with has sort of does a lot of bespoke kind of furniture. They build things to scratch, um, and very often the consideration period for that is very long. Um, but they tend to visit the website quite a lot in that process. So what that does is that drags the conversion rate down quite a lot. Um, so what we have to be careful that when we measure is that we're not saying, you know, the conversion rate is, for, for example, half a percent or one percent. That means the website's performing badly. Um, the best thing to do with, with a stat like click-through and conversion is work out if it's working well for you. Um, so is that click-through rate bringing enough sales to pay for what it needs to pay for? Is it bringing in enough kind of revenue at the end of the day? Um, and is your return on investment um, or return on ad spend um, worthwhile of that? Um, and if it is or if it's close to it, <coughs> then what you do, obviously you tweak and optimize from there, and then eventually it becomes better. Um, but yeah, <coughs> the... Uh, Google um, and AdWords, their team can provide sort of data like that, and they will do uh, for some agencies or some people they work with, and that can help you help give you a good benchmark as to where roughly you sit as a whole, um, and that can be very useful. Um, but it's it's relevant, it's relative to yourself uh, or to your own performance, I find. Yeah, but uh, can can you can, can you check it? Thank you very much. Competitors, yeah. Well, I mean, it's probably <coughs> difficult to know your competitors yeah. exactly. Uh, uh. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's. It's for. I mean, the <clears throat> the kind of the data that you can find any kind of um, sort of aggregates or averages or estimates should really need to be treated like that. Uh, um, and it kind of. I know Semrush doesn't provide that specifically, but again, you know, the estimates and stuff that it, it provides are indicative. Um, I mean, they're good stats to compare against each other because we can make. We can at least assume that they're calculating them in the same way, but. I wouldn't ever compare that kind of data with what's coming out of your own AdWords or analytics um, because I think they will be wildly different. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, another another thing. Uh, you were talking mostly about uh, Google Analytics uh, here, mm -hmm. but uh, there, are, there are different type of metrics. I, I, I don't know, a lot of uh, expensive stuff in the market. Uh, I don't know, well, from similar web to uh, KISS metric, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, would use this particular uh, tools uh, change the thing? Well, uh, because you always you said what well, okay, uh, time spent on the page you you don't count the la last last leg basically. Yeah? Mm. Any any other metrics will do it. Um, it depends how how the setups are run. I mean, we we run a lot of uh, sort of click tracking and user testing kind of software which measures interactions sort of differently. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> my example of the, the time of page, as you said, was, was just in analytics. So that one, because of the way it's measured, is quite flawed. I think 
that stat can become a lot more useful um, if the methods of measurement are more useful. I mean, predominantly I work with analytics um, because obviously it's free and it's, it's what I've spent the most of my kind of career working with. No, it's, ex it's, it's exactly you all use Google Analytics because it's Google and it's free, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, they do kind of tie us into that, and I know that makes a lot of people uneasy. Um, and you know, you could compare it to other bigger kind of high end tools like Omniture and similar. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I guess the kind of the nub of that question or the answer is know where, how that's measured. That's a real good start. And that, in my mind, is what separates those who really know their data from what not is. Um, you know, a lot of tools will try and make it as easy as possible so you don't have to get into that, but I've still seen very few that their, their data is um, kind of flawless enough for it to not need any kind of understanding. Um, and again, it's, it's where we come from is know where it's weak and then you can actually use it better. Um, <coughs> and I, I, yeah, that, that's where I take that. Um, I've, I still need to get to groups more software like similar web and, uh, so basically yeah. you're saying uh, all, all those expensive metrics uh, f well might be some point but very little point. the major point is to know where's the weakness uh, yeah. of, your, of your data what's the limitation if you understand it it's much more useful than to use some kind of very uh, sophisticated and expensive metrics and yeah. I, I mean the a lot of you know, a lot of the people who create these tools are, you know, usually clever and they do a very good job. Um, but again, it is that, you know, even ask them, you know, ask them how it's tracked um, or where the potential flaws could be, because I don't think there is such a thing as a flawless, um, you know, tool for that. Um, and that we, I do think we're probably a long way off that. So I don't, I'm not kind of writing off the industry of uh, tools as, you know, maybe they're all a bit bad, really, but. You know, they're, they're all measuring what they can, or they're all sort of reporting what they can measure. And until you know, we're all literally plugged in, and uh, Google was able to track our eye movements and our pulse and blood pressure and all of that. You know, we, we've all got to kind of make educated guesses to a degree. Okay, okay guys, uh, I'm, I'm asking the last time. Do we have any any more questions? If we have uh, no more questions, uh, um, okay, um, uh, Chris. Uh, People sometimes are, are slow or sometimes they're just, just watching the recordings and they have a question after that. So any chance they can contact you and ask a question? Yeah, yeah, by all means. I mean, probably the best uh, place to get me on is Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is chrisgreen87. Uh, could, um, could, could you type in the chat and I'll just yeah, publish yeah, it yeah, on yeah, our web page straight yeah. forward. Um, so by Twitter or, of course, uh, you can email me, which is just chris at strategic marketing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so get me from those. Uh, that information will be on the slides as well. Um, you know, Barmies get in touch there. there. There may be people who disagree. I mean, I'm particularly interested to hear if anyone thinks that there are some metrics that need to be on there or any that they think are, you know, probably more misleading. Um, but I'd, I'd be happy to hear. Okay, I'm 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 copying it to our web page. So anyone who wants to contact uh, Chris or who's watching it in the recording can contact it. Uh, well, yeah, uh, and I will upload um, slides after this presentation. Uh, if there is no more question, okay, Arab is gone anyway. Uh, if there is no more no more questions, I have to say thank you very much for for very very. Uh, well, how say very detailed one, and as oh, you, you just just put us through uh, things we will always do and never never thought about it actually. Or well, I'm, I'm talking about my myself. Many many things I've done, and you said, yeah, well, you, you you're wrong. Everything <laughs> everything you've done, you shouldn't, or you, you, at least you should look at it as a result of different from a different angle. Thank you very much. That's for, well, thank you for having me. That's, I think it was very, very useful. I'm pretty sure we'll get more um, feedback when the video is uploaded. Video will be basically straightforward is a beauty of Hangouts and YouTube. Okay, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Bogdan. You, you, you're the last one to stay uh, yeah. here. And thank you everybody who were watching us, uh, uh, us tonight. Today depends on where, where you were. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll see you again next week. Uh, ne next week we'll have 
uh, more webinars as usual. Just check our webpage. Okay, thank you and 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 goodbye, guys.